in some cases we've seen within the first two to three minutes of the adversary having initial access to a system, they've installed two different commercial off the shelf RMM tools that they're using for persistence. You know who has the worst cybersecurity, Hazel? Just guess. Jurassic Park. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Talos Threat Perspective, a regular dive into the threats and topics that impact us all. I'm your host, Hazel Burton. On today's show, we look at the brand new Cisco Talos Incident Response Quarterly Trends Report and discuss what the biggest takeaways for defenders are. So stay tuned and we'll get into it. Okay, I'm going to bring my special guests, uh, Joe Marshall and Craig Jackson, in here in a minute to discuss these attacker trends. But before we do that, let's do a quick stat rundown of the report, which covers incidents from October to December 2024. For the second quarter in a row, organizations in the education vertical were the most affected, and these accounted for nearly 30% of all Cisco Talos incident response engagements. We saw a growing number of incidents where threat actors deployed web shells against vulnerable or unpatched web applications. Web shells were deployed in 35% of incidents to support a variety of post-compromise objectives, and that is a significant increase from less than 10% in the previous quarter. Now that most certainly has an influence on the next stat, which is that the most observed means of gaining initial access was the exploitation of public-facing applications, and that accounted for nearly 40% of engagements. And that is a significant increase to last quarter because it's up from 20%. Ransomware incidents made up nearly 30% of the engagements this quarter, which is a slight drop, but overall fairly consistent. We saw some previously seen ransomware variants such as Ransom Hub and Black Basta, but there was also activity from the newly emerging ransomware threat interlock for the very first time. It's also worth mentioning as well that in 100% of the ransomware engagements, security tooling such as EDR software was either attempted to be or it was successfully uninstalled. In terms of the top security weaknesses, in nearly 40% of the total engagements, misconfigured, lack of MFA and MFA bypass accounted for the top observed security weaknesses this quarter. So our first topic that we're going to focus on is web shells, because that is certainly up there in terms of the biggest shifts this quarter. Now, in Q4, threat actors increasingly deployed a variety of open source and publicly available web shells against vulnerable or unpatched systems. So what is a web shell and what role do they play in the adversary's toolkit? Uh, well, we all know the term shell. Right. So uh, I got a shell, which means I have, you know, some way of executing commands. We a web shell is a uh, unimaginably a web based version of that. Um, in practical forensic terms, it's typically a very, very, very small file located somewhere on a web server. Um, and if uh, and there's legitimate reasons for them to exist, but for an attacker perspective, Typically, it is a remote control bit of code that sits there that allows an adversary to um, go to that web server and then start executing commands uh, as if they were sitting at the console. And these files are typically loaded on the vulnerable web servers through a variety of means and mechanisms, just depending on what the victim, it could be a remote file include, it could be an SQL or a command injection, it could be um, and I've seen all three of those, uh, it could be something as simple as you're not really thinking about how you're sanitizing your file uploads and I'm able to upload a web shell into, um, the, the web interface of whatever application that, that you've got, uh, going on there, or it's unpatched or it's a homegrown uh, system that they didn't really think about that. Um, and then, um, these web shells come with a, depending on what you're using, it's an absolute feature rich bevy of remote uh, access. I think the one thing that I'll add from an IR perspective is when we run an incident response investigation for web shells, it is not at all uncommon for us to see dozens of web shells in the same vulnerable or exposed directory. There have been even some cases where we can see situations where it looks like more than one threat actor stumbled on that exposed and vulnerable uh, web resource 
and started pushing web shells to it. It actually gets a little worse than that. Uh, this is like the old, you know who has the worst cybersecurity, Hazel? Just guess. Jurassic Park? Hackers have the worst cybersecurity. A ton of these web shells defaultly have backdoors inside of them for other hackers to take control of other web shells. Uh, it notifies, it basically notifies, it beacons out, and then the people who, who own that site now or that web shell or whatever, if you're using their code, can immediately come in and just replace your password with theirs, and now they own that web shell. So, like, it's small fish getting eaten by the bigger fish, getting eaten by the bigger fish. It sounds a bit like web shell inception. Now, the rise in web shells no doubt has had an impact on another big trend in the report, which is that ballot accounts has finally been knocked off the top spot for the top initial access vector after holding this crown for well over a year. The number one initial access vector in Q4 was the exploitation of public-facing web applications. So it, I am in no way surprised to see that, you know, uh, so-and-so went and did all my grunt work for me. They put a web shell and saying, hey, I'd like that, and I'm going to take it away from you. Now it's my web shell, and God only knows who's maybe taking it away from them. And so I'm going to load more web shells. Or like what Craig said, the scenario is entirely possible. Something is so exposed and vulnerable. Um, sure, I'll, I'll serve you my web shell as well. Now, as challenging as detecting web shells can be, there are a few things that defenders can do to weed them out before the attackers get the chance to execute the malware. They have to be able to get the file onto the web server. The file can do nothing unless it's on a victim web server. So thinking about um, bringing in a, 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 either a series of tools to do vulnerability detection and scanning or a third-party firm that can come in and do an audit of your exposed web space to see if they could do something like that is invaluable invaluable um second get a web application firewall if you don't have one already god help you i don't know how you've been surviving um like these are just very basic uh, uh things that are able to scan for like base 64 blobs or weird things happening a lot of web shells have very rote way if you haven't modified them very rote ways of communicating um when they've been activated uh so um uh, that um splunk actually put out shell sweeper last year uh, Shell Sweeper is pretty rad. Um, so the match out to our colleagues and friends over at the Splunk uh, uh, research team. We're now going to take a look at Interlock. Now, this is a relatively new ransomware group, and it was in Q4 that our incident responders were called in to help deal with an attack from this particular group. Here is Craig with the details. We investigated a an intrusion that we assessed to be associated with Interlock, I think in mid-October, which was judging by public threat intelligence around the time that they kind of first started becoming a thing. As far as kind of some of their TTPs are concerned, I feel like they came off of the trend that we saw third quarter, sort of summertime, fall of 2024, where we were seeing a lot of the fake browser updates being used for initial access. That whole trend of using uh, those fake browser updates being published to vulnerable websites, pop-ups, things like that, uh, downloading remote access Trojan or some sort of info stealer, and then that kind of cascades into the full initial access and the establishment of the beachhead by the adversary. So we did see that with them. That was their initial access method for the intrusion that we investigated. Uh, and then a lot of the TTPs that followed were were very similar to what we see with other ransomware groups. You know, the system enumeration, additional credential capture, lateral movement, sort of um, enumerating data to kind of target data for exfiltration, and then finally completing with the deployment of the, the encryptor, the ransomware. Another fairly significant stat in the Quarterly Trends report is that remote access tooling was leveraged in 100% of the ransomware incidents this quarter. Now, that is a significant shift from the previous quarter when it was only seen in 13% of ransomware or pre-ransomware engagements. So how do ransomware actors use remote tooling as part of their attack chain? It's primarily for persistence. And... The interesting thing about that statistic of 100%, you know, visibility in or 100% or use of these tools within our ransomware engagements is it's not just a single tool. We very often see them using two, three, four within the same intrusion to try to 
uh, I guess, get around any investigation efforts or to fool defenders into thinking, okay, oh, look, they use these two, but they've got a third or a fourth one sitting over here on this system that, that is going to be missed and they can maintain that persistence. Not only are they using multiple tools, they're prioritizing deployment. So we see them, in some cases, we've seen within the first two to three minutes of the adversary having initial access to a system, they've installed two different commercial off-the-shelf RMM tools that they're using for persistence. I hate to say it, it's like we have defense in depth. This is almost like offense in depth. They have so many different methods that they're trying to use to maintain persistence or to complete their actions on objectives um, that, you know, it, it just presents that many more challenges for the defenders. One specific uh, remote access tool that I'll call out is Quick Assist. Quick Assist is, is a bit of a nightmare for defenders because it's a pseudo native application for Windows. So if it's not already installed by default, it can be very easily installed through the, the, what is it, the Microsoft Store or whatever, the, the online Microsoft Store. And all you really need is the adversary needs to get the victim to enter a six digit code, you know, a six digit pin, and it basically creates a pseudo anonymous RDP style session directly to that victim system that bypasses almost all network security and authentication controls. As you can imagine, if the adversary needs to get a six digit pin from a user, they'll be using various social engineering techniques to try and get that. So that is a that is definitely something that you want to educate your teams and your colleagues on. Okay, so the last question that I asked Joe and Craig is, what can defenders do now with this information that we provide in the report? I think, you know, if you're a defender and you're, and you're stressing, oh God, these web shells sound like my kryptonite, education is the best thing you can do. Just, you can go to Git and start, just type in web shells and go look up C99, go look up R57, go look up all these strange web shells that are trying to chopper, which is like you would think yeah, is, since 2012, trying to choppers existed. No, it's still very much alive and out there. Um, it's just been modified for different types of servers like ASP or .NET or, or PHP or whatever, right? Um, you know, Python, JBoss, you name it. Um, so it, it uh, you, you will do fine there. And then from there, you're going to have to figure out what your investment situation looks like, what your risk is for the enterprise. How do I want to address this? Do I want to address this? The answer is you do, but money's not infinite. So what are the easiest? It's like web application firewalls a fine start. Um, and then from there, start thinking about like, you know, uh, you know, adversarial pen testing, think about, um, your EER solutions, have you deployed them? Um, like, I don't necessarily know that I would go out of my way to do like a local by hand, uh, 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 file diff on every single web server and seeing what's changed considering how big and how, how chaotic and how much entropy exists on these, these web servers. Um, but there are, uh, there's tooling out there for you. Use it leverage it, and then just be aware of the risk. At the end of the day, even if you don't have the best answers, but you were at least not ignorant of what the risks were, that's still a win. Take that. We saw, you know, third quarter, fourth quarter last year, seeing a lot of EDR tampering in terms of bring your own vulnerable driver being used by adversaries to fully uninstall the EDR tool. Uh, and what we've seen now is a kind of a shift in, in tactic and technique to actually disabling the service that is supporting that EDR tool on, on these systems. So any systems where the EDR profile does not have a connector password or a tamper protection enabled, it's probably going to disable the EDR on that system. So again, reiterating, make sure that you have your connector protection on your EDR connector, your tamper protection on whatever it's called with your given EDR of choice, make sure it is enabled to uh, prevent adversaries from removing that from a system or disabling it. Yep, and just to drive that point home even more, the report details that in 100% of the ransomware engagements in Q4, security tooling such as EDR software was attempted to be or successfully uninstalled. So definitely something to look at if you're not already. To read the full Talos Quarterly Trends report, which contains lots more insights, lots more recommendations for defenders, simply head to blog.talosintelligence.com. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the TTP. Do subscribe to the Talos YouTube channel to know when a new episode drops. Until next time, do take care.